so we, we hiked up to the castle today and got to look out at everything and, and it, I mean it, it is truly one of the prettiest places that I have ever ever been I think so you all are really living in a, in a wonderful place so I will try not to 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 bore you and to save some time for questions and stuff at the end um, let me just tell you that a lot of you are the problem that we have in politics because you aren't watching television anymore because you're living online and because you're interacting with politicians in fundamentally very different ways than your parents were. The, the issue we have in the United States and really across most of the world is that when people have a choice between watching soccer or watching cats that play the piano or if they want to watch politics, people choose to watch the cat playing the piano and they choose to watch soccer. And that's a problem for us in politics because we have to try to get people out to vote and we have to try to persuade them to vote for us. There was a, a New York Times columnist who said that when broadcast television started, that we lived in a 24-hour news cycle. And you have to wait 24 hours for news to get to you. Well, with cable news and CNN, we began to live in a 24-minute news cycle. And I can tell from being in Europe for the past week, it's the same. Every 24 minutes, it's the same news on CNN again and again, right? And now, this columnist said, we live in a 24-second news cycle. That might be a tad dramatic, but in some ways, in politics, it's absolutely true that the scandal of the minute or the problem of the minute can be pushed aside by another more entertaining or interesting piece of news and information. We really live in a world of short attention spans where people now are the, the, the you know, hot new social media in the United States that all the journalists are obsessed with in 2016 is Snapchat. Who in here is on Snapchat, by the way? Anybody? A few of you, okay. Snapchat now amongst users under 30 years old in the United States is absolutely their go-to platform. And politicians are trying to figure out how to use Snapchat to engage people. And by the way, for, for those who are on Snapchat, I highly encourage you to look at Hillary Clinton's Snapchat and to follow her. I think she's got the best uh, Snapchat, probably one of them, uh, besides ours for Rand Paul, of uh, uh, anybody running in 2016. Uh, she's doing a really wonderful job. But my, but my point here is how do you get a policy discussion going in a 10 second snap. How do you talk about the Israeli-Palestinian crisis in 140 characters? How do you discuss the migrant problem or discussion here in the country in an image on Instagram? How can you really have that discussion? And all of you in this room, that's how you're living in 10 second snaps and it makes it so hard for campaigns that used to have a lot of time with voters on television to actually have larger discussions. There was a study that came out recently that said that the video on Facebook, that the length of the video on Facebook that people are most likely to watch to completion is 22 seconds. Think about that for a second. 22 second time span is all people have on Facebook to actually finish a video before they're moving on to something else. And by the way, why are we really on Facebook? Why are most people on Facebook? They're on Facebook not to engage with a politician, but they're on Facebook to see who broke up with who, right? Who's getting married, who's having children, to show the baby pictures, to check in at cool places that they went to. That's why they're on Facebook. And it makes our job in politics so difficult. These are some numbers from the back end of, of Senator Paul's website. You can see here that in an increasingly mobile 
first world, and most people in Europe under 35 use mobile number one to engage online, right? And in a mobile first world, look at the amount of time that's spent on average compared to desktop, 35 seconds again. We are talking about seconds to engage with people. We are talking about seconds to get policy across. This is a serious problem for engagement. This is a serious problem in politics. Two and a half times almost for people on desktop and laptop. These are television stats in the United States. Television watching decreasing every year for young people, decreasing as they go more and more and more online. And then I have this last fact, which is true. Americans spend more time on Facebook than with their pets, okay? <coughs> people love their pets, but they love Facebook more. And we don't even have to talk about the scary studies that have been done where people said that they would choose their mobile phones over their spouse. Chelsea, of course, I would choose you. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people in these studies chose their mobile phone. It's pretty freaking scary. Right? This is the world that we live in. Perhaps this is even scarier. Perhaps. I went to this conference with Google this year in Anaheim, California. The conference is called VidCon. I have never been to anything like this, ever. What happened? The first day that I showed up, I saw this guy who I'd never seen before get out of the car. And all of a sudden, hundreds of screaming teenagers went and ran after this guy, trampling each other to try to get to him. Everyone had purple and pink and orange hair running after this guy. This guy was a YouTube star. The entire conference is centered around YouTube stars. And people that are growing up nowadays are more attached in this study that came out this year more attached teenagers are to YouTube stars. Everyone in blue is a YouTube star. Everyone in red is a traditional star. This study found that amongst young people in the United States, they had more influence and engagement and felt they were more authentic with the YouTube stars than people like Taylor Swift. They would buy products more than YouTube stars sold them. I remember this one teenager on this panel. This blew my mind, but it was a great lesson for, for me as a marketer. She said that she couldn't live without seeing what her YouTube star, this, this YouTube star was doing. Every morning she would wake up and go to his channel and see what he had done that morning. And this YouTube star was doing things like brushing his teeth. And she couldn't live without it. She couldn't live without it. This is what's going on. It's voyeurism, honestly. People love this attachment. They love it. What about our elected officials? Is this the future? We, for Senator Rand Paul, streamed just two days ago, an entire day, it was the first time this has ever been done in politics, from when he ate breakfast to through the Democratic debate. We streamed the entire day of him on using Ustream and on Facebook Mentions, which is a, a new live stream tool on Facebook. I think you're going to see more and more politicians use the internet, use live streaming, post videos, maybe none of them brushing their teeth, right? But at soccer games, talking to voters, carrying GoPros around, one of my clients is a senator from Ohio, and one of the coolest things I think as a millennial that I've seen him do is he goes on these bike rides across Ohio, and he carries a GoPro on his helmet. It's pretty cool, and there's some really cool video content that is made from that. That, I believe fundamentally, is what voters our age pay attention to. There's a wonderful book that I send to all of my clients. It's called Post-Broadcast Democracy. It's written by a Princeton professor named Marcus Pryor. And in it, he talks about the problems that we have nowadays. 
He talks about how my grandparents, they went home after work, and they only had three TV choices in the United States, ABC, CBS, or NBC. And the whole country was on the same amount and type of news because they could only choose for one of three choices. Think about in this room, if I went around and asked each of you individually what's your number one news source, how many different news sources we would get? A lot more than three. A whole lot more than three. <coughs> and prior, in his book, he did an experiment. And the experiment showed that when people have a choice between news and watching nothing, they choose to watch news and interact with news. But when they can see Kim Kardashian or watch Bayern Munich or watch Dirk or watch something else, watch, I cannot tell you how many different European pop star shows I've seen since I've been over here in every different language. People are choosing to watch those over engage with politics. And it's caused a big gap in political knowledge and information, a much bigger gap than we ever used to have previously. There's a communications professor at Virginia Tech. He's done a bunch of studying on the internet and found, which this just makes sense, but we need a study to prove that it makes sense, right? That information that's interactive and engaging, voters are more likely to internalize. This is centered to everything that we're doing in 2016. This is why the stuff I'm gonna show you like videos that engage people, like quizzes online, like puzzle games. This is what this is the future of political advertising. It's not shoving a 30-second television ad at you that now you just skip over to get to other content. It's engagement. What else does digital matter? You might not believe this is true. But after the 2012 election, there was a bipartisan study in the United States, and it found that the internet is the number one trusted source of political news and information. People trust what they see. Over 50% of people on Google click on the first link that they see. 70% of people don't go past the first page when they're finding out more information. People just click on whatever's number one. And most people, a lot of people, don't even know the difference in a paid ad up there and an organic search result. When, when we're actually paying to show you something that is our own truth on the campaign. A lot of voters, 41% in a Pew study, didn't know the difference. They didn't know that it was a paid ad. They believed that as truth. This could potentially be very scary because everyone has their own truth. Every campaign is producing its own truth. The internet does matter in terms of voter turnout. People ask a lot of times, does this all matter? What's the real impact? What's the real impact, Vincent? Does this really matter? This study was done in the state of California with Facebook and the University of California, San Diego. It's one of the best studies on voter turnout and the internet. What they did was they split tested the state into two, essentially. Half the state got this I voted sticker, and the other didn't. And what they found in the study was in the parts of the state that used the I voted sticker, where people used it, voter turnout was increased. That's powerful. And that's one social network and one sticker. It's really powerful. There's a big debate, and certainly in academia, about these two terms, selective exposure and incidental exposure. And I want you all to think about yourself and which one you think better fits you in terms of impacting your political preferences. What the first one says is that you go online and you seek information that purposely reinforces your views already. I fall into this. I'm a Republican. Guess where I go to read online? Washington Post. The Post? No way. That's a lit paper. No way. 
Fox News. Fox News, thank you. Fox News, the only fair and balanced in the, in the United States, okay? Fox, Fox News. Liberals, they go to BuzzFeed, which I go to BuzzFeed too, but for the cat kids, so which are going to have that later, okay? BuzzFeed, CNN, MSNBC, people go online and they read things like zombies that just tell them what they already believe. It's scary. This study by this professor actually at my university, the University of Texas, showed that doing this polarizes people, right? Because you never get new information. Think about my grandparents. They were constantly getting new information. The news was more unbiased than it is today. Well, now you just go and seek information that you already believe. This makes it so difficult in politics in 2016 because we're actually trying to win new voters over. This second term incidental exposure says that if you use social media a lot, and, and, and this uh, professor, one of his more famous quotes, is that the more you use the internet, the more you're going to be exposed to new ideas. So he found that the amount of time people spent online corresponded to the amount of new information that makes sense that they're receiving about politics. Think about your friends on, on Facebook. Sure, if you're conservative, you might have some liberal friends. If you're liberal, you might have some conservative ones. If you're like me, you see a liberal post and you hide it, but that's just me, okay? So this incidental exposure talks about that. Think about the impact from a campaign sense, where we're trying to get everyone on Facebook trying to get content into the news feed, right? That's where all, that's, this is where all interactions happen on Facebook is in this news feed. All of them. And mostly they happen on mobile. So how do I get my client into this news feed? I either pay for it like Southwest Airlines did, right? I either pay for an ad or I have to have content that's sticky, that's engaging, that you in this room are going to share. Because if you're not going to share it, I will never get it seen, and then I can never actually reach voters and try to persuade them. And by the way, a side note, we can talk about this for an hour, but you should know how much information Facebook is keeping on you, right? There's a term that they don't like to use, but it's called edge rank, and that's the loose term for the algorithm that determines how content gets to you. Think about all the different friends you have in your life. I started, when I was on Facebook, it was my high school friends, then I had my college friends, then I had my grad school friends, I had my friends from church. My friend groups keep adding, but there's only so much space in this news feed. So what Facebook does is they remember every time you interact. They remember when you creep on your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, when you look at those photos, they remember all of this. And they show you the content that you've engaged with. Think about this aspect in politics. If you're not producing on Facebook engaging content and you're not paying for it, people will never see it. So you could have a page of 2 million people, of 10 million people, and you could post something and 100,000 people could see it. But you could also have 5 million people see it. It's all about the social share and engagement, and it's driving politicians to post and do crazy videos, and to do crazy things, because it's all about reach now. So, so how do we reach people? I prefer this cat with the with the bread. So, how do we reach people in a society where people prefer to look at these cats than they do to have serious political issues? How? Now we get into my opinion on how. We use entertainment media. And I'm going to start by talking about two interesting studies. This first study showed that entertainment media does actually prime voters 
for serious news. It shows that news like Jon Stewart, in their study, made people six times more likely to want to hear hard news and to seek information than if they had never been exposed to that news at all, if they were watching cat games all day. So in that sense, from a democratic perspective, I'm happy that there's shows like Jon Stewart, even though they normally poop all over my Republican friends. Okay? But I'm happy because it shows more engagement. This study's kind of scary, but it's great for us in politics, in some ways. It's important for us to remember, this study talks about how voters forget where information comes from and that they count essentially a lot of sources equal. If you read something on BuzzFeed, you would count it equal to reading it in Der Spiegel. If you read something on the Washington Post, that's serious journalism old school, you would count that equal as watching Jon Stewart that might have been making jokes about something. It's a little scary that as time goes on, voters forget where the information has actually come from. For my age, for a lot of us in this room, the traditional 30-second ad is dead, where someone stands there and they tell you their, their issues, and they say why they support something. You know why it's dead? Because we will click out of it. Because we'll watch something else. Because it's 10 seconds on Snapchat. Because it's 140 characters. Because we won't watch something anymore when we have all these choices that we don't want to watch, which is beautiful, but it's scary for politicians, and it's scary in a little bit for democracy. Because how do we reach your age group? And by the way, you all are obviously different. You're sitting here talking about this. Think of your friends. Think of your friends that are watching soccer instead of politics. So I wanted to talk for a little bit now about what's going on in the United States. Uh, how, did, how campaigns are running from a digital perspective. Look, I'm sure you've read all the articles, they're probably true, a lot of them. President Obama ran a wonderful digital campaign. And as somebody who works in this field of digital politics, I think without him having done such a good job as he did, Republicans would never have really had the fire to catch up to where they are now. His digital team is dispersed. They're not working for a single one of Hillary or Bernie Sanders. So some of them are doing their own things. Um, but here are some facts about an average digital campaign in America. Normally they have an in-house staff. Normally they'll have a digital director, maybe two, three, four, five, six people on the Republican side and underneath until they get the nomination, okay? On average, campaigns might spend between 15 and 30% of their budgets on digital, which by the way, when I was in Austria this week, I, I met with the center-right OVP party, and they were talking about spending 30% on digital, which is much higher on average than most Republican campaigns will actually spend. Because we have an issue in the Republican party, which is that most of our budgets and everything are controlled by consultants who make their money on television advertising. And they don't want to spend money on digital because they're incentivized in making money on things like television advertising. Whereas the Democrats seem to get this one. By the way, I can't tell you how many times, it's a little sad, I, I spoke at this Tea Party event, and a woman in the crowd, she got mad and she said, or she asked me a question and she was mad, she said, you know what, Vincent? This is all great, this internet and stuff. But Google, they work with the Democrats. Why are we giving them Republican money? And it's that kind of mentality that is still permeates a lot of the Republican Party base. They're, you know, they are they're very pro-privacy, a lot of them. Um, they are scared, and they've heard that Silicon Valley and technology and young people in Obama oh my gosh, why are we engaging in this? And we're finally moving forward, but it's taken a lot of time. And this last point, most campaigns work on a centralized database, and you should be, you know, 
I know that the privacy issue has come up a lot in both of our countries. And by the way, the, the man I work for, Rand, Rand Paul, is probably the biggest advocate against bulk data collection. He's fought the NSA. There's a lot of things that you might support. Um, so register to vote soon and have vote absentee. No, okay. Um, so, um, uh, but you would be interested to know how much information that you give online that I can advertise to you on. If you've ever bought a magazine subscription online, every time you're on Facebook liking different pages, the information you give Facebook, the movies you like, you know, who your friends are, what you do when you're logged into Facebook, I can even advertise to you now. Who has a Gmail account? Most of you. I can advertise to you based on the type of emails you get, which is a little scary, right? I can advertise to you based, it's scary and good, it's good for me as the advertiser, okay? But I can advertise to you based on who the emails come from in politics. So if I was Hillary Clinton, I could advertise to people getting Bernie Sanders emails and just run trash ads about how bad Bernie Sanders was. <laughs> Think about that. It's crazy. It's crazy cool for me. So what is the future of, of all of this, of entertainment media? I'm going to show you a couple examples. This, this first example is an online ad that Senator Paul did that I'm going to show you both for the content and I want to show you about the engagement at the end of the ad. Oh, let me see. You can just let me Seen a politician in Germany take something to a wood chipper <laughs> and then chainsaw your attack code. So this ending here, this is what I really love. So it's not just about the content, but it's about how this ended. And this ended with a choice. Do you remember those books when I was growing up? There were books where you would read 10 pages and then it would let you choose how the book would end and what would happen next. You were at a road and you could pick to go left or pick to go right. That's what this, this ad is. You can pick how you would destroy the tax code. We ran an ad for a client against the Iran nuclear deal where we showed the ad. There, uh, I want to show it to you. So this, this ad will actually, here, I'll just show it to you and then I'll talk about it. On July 14th, 2015, the United States signed a bad deal with the Islamic Republic of Iran, a country that burns our flag and chants death to America. Congress has 60 days to oppose this bad deal. Leading Democrats are already protesting this deal with the number one state sponsor of terrorism. Do you support or oppose this bad Iran deal? <laughs> so look, here's why I didn't expect a laugh from this serious topic. But here's, here's why I like this ad. Think about this from a persuasion perspective. At the end of this, if somebody clicks they support the deal, we take them to more information on why the deal is bad and continuously persuade them. If they oppose the deal, we take them to a website where they can call their, their United States Senator. That's pretty cool. From a political ad perspective, in my view, this is something that matches engagement and it matches persuasion, right? Which is what this is about, entertaining people and then persuading them, explaining to them why something is bad or good. This 
type of ad, we got whitelisted to by Google to run this as an ad before you would watch a you know a music video or something. You might see this and you could have engaged with this ad. That's pretty cool. Can you imagine here in Germany if the chancellor was running ads and she was asking you which issue was most important and the video would take you to different videos based on what you said was most important. And by the way, every time somebody clicked on support or oppose, I put a cookie, Google did, and we can advertise them, put a cookie in their browser and then we can track them and run different messages to them again and again on this issue. As soon as you clicked, I support the deal, bam, we were running a bunch of ads to you on why the deal was bad. That's great, so keep clicking, please. I want to show you this. This, this might be one of the my things I'm most proud of that we ever did in, on our on, on, uh, online. So <laughs> I do practice what I preach. We brought the, the cat gift to American political negative advertising. So this is a website that we built called DoFeed against one of my clients, Dan Patrick, uh, against his opponent. So I'll just let you read this. But but this let me explain what this is doing first. This is telling the story. His opponent was the lieutenant, the incumbent lieutenant governor of Texas. As he was presiding over the, the Senate chamber in Texas, there was a filibuster by this woman named Wendy Davis on the issue of abortion. And my client, Dan Patrick, uh, he was trying to bring light to the issue that the lieutenant governor, the incumbent lieutenant governor, lost control. So that's what's going on. I will, I will let you read this. This is true, he was out having a glass of wine like that, like that cat. Snapchat. 
and engage with them, and they did engage. This is another one on the, on the uh, left side here. This was for a U.S. senator in Maryland. We, we put those microphones up and said, tell Senator Carlin, said, tell Senator Carlin no to the bad Iran deal. We had over 100,000 people use it there, too. This is cool. And in my opinion, this is the future of advertising, where political campaigns and organizations and special interests and issue groups are putting you and you're engaging in the actual content. People did it, 178,000 uses in 24 hours. Also, letting supporters create content. We play a game in the US called paper football, where you print out a football, and then you flick the football through, people put up their hands like this, and a lot of people do it when they're drinking beer and stuff. So you just put up your hands and you flick the football through. Well, what we did around the Super Bowl for Senator Paul, we asked people to print this out at, at home, we, we just made this paper football for him. We posted it on Facebook. We said, print it out. A lot of people did. We asked them to send in pictures of them doing it. And we were engaging with them and retweeting them and posting them on Facebook. It was generating attention for the senator. It was generating website visits. It was generating cookie pools. It was generating email addresses from which I could target people and we can advertise on an individual level. During the first debate, the senator got into an argument with Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey, about the NSA spying. We asked people on Facebook to draw in a cartoon of what happened and send them in. This is pretty cool. Politicians and campaigns need to more and more use their supporters to help generate content, to be part of the campaign, to get them engaged, to get them entertained. We crowdsourced the, the, uh, Senator Paul's t-shirts on his store. We asked people, help design his next t-shirt. Submit your designs. We had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of designs. Then, the campaign picked like 10 of them, and we posted them again and said, vote for your favorite ones. And they voted for this first one. The NSA knows I bought this Rand Paul t-shirt, right? <laughs> that came in number one. Those are our supporters. They're, they're pro-privacy. With the government not spying on us illegally, right? So this, this set, you can buy all three in our store right now. Uh, actually, I don't think you can buy them in Germany. You have to be in America because they're considered a campaign donation. Um, so these are one of the best-selling items in our store. Now, and it makes sense, right, because people help create them. How cool is it if political parties and campaigns go to the people who are supporting them who are going to wear the t-shirts? I can't tell you growing up how many itchy, scratchy, weird t-shirts that I was given on campaigns when I was volunteering that I never wanted to wear. I wear these shirts because I help vote for them. Right? You're actually voting for the stuff you want to wear. You're voting for the campaign logo. For Senator Ted Cruz, who I worked for for three years, we let people crowdsource his bumper stickers. I still see them all over Texas. It just makes sense. More people are going to buy something that they help to create. Hillary Clinton is doing something really cool. Every week, she lets another person take over her social media accounts. I'm sure it's all staged, okay, but, but they get to take over and post things that they want on her social media accounts about why they support her with their videos, etc. That's pretty cool. That's engaging, and it's different. Senator Marco Rubio did something really cool. He went on to Google and figured out what questions people were asking about him on Google. You would be, you would be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this. Um, so, oh. so Google sends around a list of, where did I send it to? <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, where did I find? Might be okay. I think okay. 
Here it is. What are the top questions for each candidate? Look, this is what people in America are typing into Google. How tall is Jeb Bush? How old is Jeb Bush? What is Jeb Bush's real name? <laughs> Where did Jeb Bush go to college? What is Jeb short for? So two questions of the top ten on Jeb Bush are about his name. Crazy. <laughs> Senator Cruz. Is Ted Cruz Canadian? Senator Cruz was born in Canada, actually. What religion is Ted Cruz? How did Steve Jobs fleece Carly Fiorina? Is Carly Fiorina a feminist? How much is she worth? Okay, let's look at Rand, Rand Paul. Where is Rand Paul in the polls? Is Rand Paul a doctor? Is Rand Paul a libertarian? What does he stand for? Marco Rubio, why are Marco Rubio's chances rising? Where did Marco Rubio go to college? Is Marco Rubio Hispanic? <laughs> what nationality is Marco Rubio? Okay, these are the questions that people put in Google. And what Marco Rubio did, which by the way, oh, let's look at Donald Trump's just because it'll, it'll be fun. <laughs> Who is Donald Trump's wife? How did Donald Trump make his money? How tall is he? How old is he? How much is he worth? Very important when you're deciding to vote for, right? How much is he worth? If you listen to Mr. Trump, it's very important. So, so what, uh, so what Marco Rubio did was he looked at this, and guess what he did? He answered the questions on video that people were asking, even silly ones. This is cool though. That's cool. That's engagement because whether it's good or bad, this is what people are typing into Google, what they want to know. This is what voters want to know. And by the way, I can't tell you how many times voters also do things like misspell people's names. I remember when I was working for Senator Cruz, about a fourth or a fifth of our website uh, search traffic came from people typing in his last name spelled like Tom Cruz and not Ted Cruz, which just makes sense, right? You don't know that you hear it. But it's important for us in politics to know all of this. This is what voters are caring about. Two of the top 10 questions of Jeb Bush were about his height. So that's what I have for you. I want to take questions, um, but I, I hope that you gain from, from that, that it's really, politics is changing so rapidly in terms of the way that, that politicians, both in elected office and out, are engaging with voters. The Speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States, this is on his website, this is not just campaigns that are doing this. Speaker Boehner attacked President Obama with Taylor Swift gifts. <laughs> this is American politics, ladies and gentlemen. Taylor Swift, cat memes, Snapchat. I don't know what video that's from, but. This is on the official speaker website. Not running for office, attacking Barack Obama with Taylor Swift gifts. I'll just leave you with this. Thank you.